Halloween is upon us, so let me show you how I combine 3D printing, painting, and a Raspberry Pi to make this mask come to life. When I was a kid in Australia, Halloween pretty much didn't exist but it has gained traction over the years. And now that I'm a parent, my kids love to dress up, make decorations and go trick or treating. And that brings us to this video, which is a Halloween special. And it comes courtesy of one of my patrons, Rito, who requested I make a video trying out these Raspberry Pi eyes. Now I know the timing for this is less than ideal because it's too close to Halloween for anyone to be able to follow these steps. I did try to order it a while ago, but unfortunately it just didn't come in time. Anyway, let's jump into it. It's a pretty cool project, so let's have a look at how it came together. Patron Rito sent me a link to this awesome kit. As you can see, the final result is two animated eyes, but that's after you put it together. Basically, you add all of these parts to a Raspberry Pi, and that includes a little shield or hat, and two little LCD screens, and then the cabling in between. I had a spare Raspberry Pi sitting around, so it seemed like a great idea for a Halloween video. In America, the price is 50 US dollars, and I found a local supplier, which I've used before and recommend, to find it for just under $90 Australian. One of the things that really attracted me to this project was the excellent documentation. It takes you through step by step with hardware, software, and even sections on how you can customize the hardware to add buttons and joysticks to control the eyes manually, as well as customizing the graphics for the eyes. This documentation is linked in the description, and it's what we'll be following in this video. When the package finally arrived, the contents were as expected, but it was nice to find extra pins as well as wires. My first job was to solder in all of the header pins, including this double row female header that connects to the Raspberry Pi, and then two single rows of male headers labeled TFT. You can also get an OLED version, but that's not what I had. Matching male headers also needed to be soldered into each of the LCD screens. Now the colors on the cabling don't really matter as long as you put them in in the same order from side to side. So carefully making sure they're not tangled, you insert them one at a time and then turn your attention to the other end and plug them in in exactly the same order. The two outer pins are labeled, so all you need to do is to make sure for each screen that you get the order matched up for these. Repeat that process for the second side and it looks a little bit like this. As you can see, the spare header pins left over, which we'll talk about later. The instructions now permit us to pull off the protective plastic covers. With the basic hardware out of the way, we can turn our attention to the software page, and it tells us we need to download an image for Raspbian Buster Lite. Once this image is downloaded, you use a program such as Belina Etcher to select your image, select your drive, and then click flash. After a few minutes, your SD card will be ready to insert into the Raspberry Pi and power it up. You'll need a keyboard and a screen, and we start by opening Raspberry Config. This will open up an intuitive interface, which we use to set up things like the wireless so we can download and install the software. The instructions are really good and you don't need to have any experience with Linux. All you need to be able to do is type in three lines in succession. This will begin the installation script and the only thing you really need to know is which version of the screen that you have. On my Pi 3B, installation took somewhere between 10 to 15 minutes and it will finish by asking you to reboot. There is a guide in the instructions on what to do if your display is glitchy, but fortunately I didn't need to follow that at all because my eyes were working perfectly from the very first boot. I run everything from a power bank and what you're seeing here is the default configuration, but what I ended up with was much more customized. So let's look step by step how I achieved that. Firstly, the docs are really good in explaining how the graphics work. There's several files that make up the various portions of the eye and each one is explained and there's multiple versions to experiment with. One of the best parts is that all of these files are accessible on the SD card in a Windows machine. There's a file called eyes.py, which is where any customization is made. And then there's a folder called graphics and inside there are all of the JPEGs, PNGs and SVGs discussed in the docs. Here is the default iris as well as the Schlera and then there's the Dragon version of the Schlera as well. To select one of these, all you need to do is enter the file name in eyes.py. For instance here, I amend the file name, boot up the Pi, and you can see that the Schlera around the eyes has now changed to the darker, more bloodshot version. I open the standard iris file in Photoshop, 
and played with the hue and saturation, giving it a bright red color throughout, and then saved the file as red hyphen iris. It doesn't really matter what you call it, as long as back in iris.py, you update the file name to match. The other thing you can experiment with are the SVG files that control how the eyelids open and close, as well as the iris shape. Once again, there's a dragon version, which I set, and that gave me the long vertical slit for the eyeball that you're seeing here. It would be possible to do a lot more customization on these eye animations, but with these simple steps, pretty much anyone should be able to achieve what they're after. For me, my styling was done. On the hardware page, it explains how you can use an analog joystick to manually move the eyes around, a photo cell to automatically dilate the pupil depending on how bright the room is, and also instructions to use buttons to make the eyes blink and wink. Blink by default was tied to pin 23, so I followed the wiring diagram, soldered in a header on 23 and ground, connected up the other end to a momentary switch, and that was the extent of my changes to get this to work. If you look at the instructions for the software, we can see that pin 23 is already set up for Blink, therefore we don't need to change any code, pull down resistors and everything like that are already done for us. Here's the end result. I turned off auto blink and now every time I press the button, I can manually open and close the eyes. Satisfied, I turn my attention to the mask. I did a lot of searching, but on my manufactory, I found this mask of the warrior, which I was very happy to pay $5 for. It had intricate details all over, but overall had a pretty menacing look. I'm not sure if the demos here were printed on FDM or in resin, but I had a plan on how I was going to do mine. This X3D Pro Marble Filament is something I've used before. It does a really good job of hiding the layer lines, and I think stone for this is really well suited as a basis before painting. With no obvious print orientation, this needed some special prep in Simplify 3D. I moved the chin below the bed to give it a flat bottom, and then I manually placed support pillars to support the top of the skull. All of this, together with the raft, added up to a 50 hour print, and we know they're normally optimistic with that, so it's actually going to be longer. And unfortunately, after what appeared to be a series of partial clogs, the print finally failed, but by this stage it had been a day and a half, and I was running very short on time. Back to the drawing board, I got searching again, and found this Halloween mask on my mini factory once again. According to the pictures, I could print it face down like this, which would reduce the printing time a great deal, but I also like the overall style. One thing that suited me was the small and beady eyes, which means I could use a Dremel to open them up to better match the LCD. Once again, in Simplify 3D, I used the manual support placement tool to set up the minimum I thought I could get away with. I also moved the STL down vertically to chop off the bottom and give it enough of a flat surface to print up from. Print time for this one, a much more palatable 8 hours and 15 minutes. This one was successful, but only just. Midway through the print, I noticed it had become dislodged. I paused the print, moved it back where I thought it was meant to be, and then used a hot glue gun to secure it in six places, which allowed it to finish. After removing the support material, I got out a scalpel and carefully removed any leftover pieces of hot glue. Considering how close this print came to failure, the final result is actually quite good. There is a layer shift around the model, but for this application, I don't think it actually matters. Nevertheless, I used a Dremel tool and I quickly cleaned up the extra bit of filament from where the layer shift was, leaving a much more subtle crevice in its place. My next job was to apply some paint, and I used a glove instead of a brush because I wanted to be quite fast and rough with this, especially when I needed to remain time efficient. My technique was pretty straightforward. I used my fingers to apply some dark grey around all of the edges, making sure to get some texture inside all of the little crevices. After sufficient coverage, I then used a rag to buff off the big chunks, but still leave some dark smears behind. On any surfaces that were really shallow and therefore showed up the layer lines, I decided to apply some extra black to hide them. After this, to add the horror aspect, I dipped my finger in the red and decided to have some blood effect leaking from the mouth, the nostrils and around the eyes. This whole thing only took around 10 minutes to paint, and I think the final result is most unpleasant, and that's exactly what I was aiming for. To mount the two LCD screens, I modelled up this very simple bracket in Onshape that I designed to be printed from flexibles. Out came my specially modified Cocoon Create Touch with a Flexion extruder, and it really does eat up this type of work. If you're interested, this was the first printer I did a series on modding back in the early days of the channel. 
This part was hard to model accurately, but the final dimensions ended up being there or thereabouts, both for fitment to the mask, as well as for correct fitment to the two LCD screens. Each screen received an M3 by 6mm bolt in each corner to hold it in place. With both of the eyes now secured in place, I decided it was time for a dummy fit inside the mask. As expected, the cutouts for the eyes were just a little bit too small and also a little bit too wide, so I decided to use a Dremel to open up the inside of each. Doing this with PLA is always a little bit tricky as it tends to overheat and then melt, but since I was working in such a small area and had such a small amount to remove, everything still went well. I made sure to clean up the inside as well, so there wouldn't be any loose bits to scratch the LCD screens. Final fitment was not perfect, but it was much much better, well within tolerance. The model I chose was actually asymmetrical with the eyes, so it always looks a little bit off, but I still think it's a success overall. The TPU eye mount was held in place with four small dabs of hot glue, and then a Velcro strap was secured to it to hold all of the wiring neatly out of the way. There is a cavity left over for the battery, unfortunately my power bank is just a little bit too big for this, but with a smaller one, the installation would actually be quite tidy. And here is the final product. It's not perfect, but overall I think it's pretty neat. The design of the mask, the paint, and then those unnerving eyes all adds together to make this thing pretty creepy. I'm hoping on Halloween I can make some trick-or-treaters quite uncomfortable. And that's it, a series of simple steps that come together for a pretty cool project. And I have to say this project was definitely cursed at times, from the long delivery to the 3D prints that just wouldn't print, but we got there in the end. How am I going to use this? Well, I can see three main ways. Firstly, I can envisage putting this in a decoration at the front of my house for trick-or-treaters who come to visit. Secondly, I can see it going at the bottom of a trick-or-treat bucket, so as people go to put in treats, they get a little bit of a shock. And thirdly, putting it in some sort of box, handing it to someone with my finger on the eyelid button, so as they receive the item and open it, the eyes all of a sudden spring to life. Either way, it's been fun, and I hope it might inspire you to do a maker project of your own this Halloween. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy 3D printing and Halloween. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.